We just finished with a live show, and I put this as a little three-minute intro in the beginning of it, and I just want people to understand what I'm looking at in more detail here. Again, Alexi's gravity flyer on the left, there's mine on the right. You're going to see the wobble in both, and then his begins to lift. I figured this thing out on the tuning that he's doing for the motors and the field. So let's get into detail on this. Okay, let's identify what we have here first. Our Tesla coil is on. We're at 33.3 volts. And we have our motors running. Now, I like to run the bottom one. It's a 12 volt motor. So 11.5 volts are going into it. The upper one we're going to change a little bit and it's going to manipulate the field. So what you have to know here is that your motor are tied into your high voltage. So there is two high voltage flybacks in series put together on this and they're connected. Now they're connected into the center and the Tesla coil is connected to the outside or the frame of the thing. So I'm checking the field. Now this is important. I'm looking for a field that goes all around the whole craft here. You can see as I do it, we're not getting a very good field yet. And it has to do with our motor speed versus our field strength. Now, we just got something. What, it's kind of misleading sometimes when this light lights up because it'll continue to stay lit in the charged field. So you have to make sure it moves back and forth in and out of the field to kind of make sure it restarts. You see right there, there's points in it where the field's real good. And it'll start up just like that and then it'll go even brighter when it's good so you have to play with this a little bit and that's why you see me moving this in and out a lot I'm, tr I'm trying to make sure the field gets over the entire craft here so again the Tesla coil is on the outside but you can see at 33 volts I don't have very strong now I could easily push this up to 40 volts and get that thing to light up the whole time but the interaction between the high voltage, the disc speed, and the Tesla coil have to be perfect on this. So what you'll find me doing, yeah, check the field, make sure it's good. What you'll find me doing is I'm going to change the motor speed. And we're going to get a lot better run out of this thing. So right now it's, it's okay. Right now I can tell you I'm changing the motor speed. And what motor I'm changing is not the lower one. I, I set that one the whole time. It's the upper disc that I'm changing. Right there. You just saw that imbalance. How it started to shake. Okay. I'm looking for a feel right after this imbalance. So this, you saw in the beginning where it started to shake and then it actually started to lift. When I say it smooths out, I just mean that the vibration going on starts to go away. You can see right there, we just hit a field. We're getting an expansion from the disc on the field now. See how it's starting to light up a lot more all the way around? It took a minute to get there, but we're there. So now I'm going to change the motor speed again. Right there, I'm looking for the edge of the vibration versus the field. So I know where the field is, and I'm still adjusting that motor on the top a little bit. I'm trying to look for the balance. Just a little bit shaky, but just a little bit off. See right there again? You, you can see it right when I'm messing with the, the actual motor on the top. It's creating a balance and imbalance here. So we still have our field running. We know we're still good. I need that end of that vibration state right before it smooths back out. That's the exact point right there where Lexi gets it right before he lifts it. So when I'm tuning this, just understand the top motor only. There it goes again. That little bit of vibration. I, I honestly wish in this potentiometer that I'm turning, I had it where I can just move it more slowly. I need a more fine-tuned potentiometer than the one I have on here. It's too coarse. So, 
we're going to get into that imbalanced state right there. You can see it. I'm so close. So close to almost the perfect state. Just a little bit off. You see it smoothed out right there? That point where it goes from that vibration to when it smooths out is right when it actually lifts it. So let's stop this right here and let's go back to that original video on the lift. And I want to show you that right now. So here we go. On the left is the Lexi's gravity flyer. Take a look at the wobble. You can see it there. It's just slightly off balance. I think mine is too coarse on the tuning on that potentiometer. It's not giving me the fine tuning I need. You can see his just barely and then it lifts. So there's more things going on here than just the wobble, but we're going to go back to the wobble and look at it again. Okay, we get back to our testing now. We saw the split screen, now we'll go back to our testing. I'm in a state right now where you can see it's shaking a little bit. Not just normal vibration and the whole thing. I'll adjust the motors here in a minute on the top only. And we're going to get it to go back to a vibration state. Right there. I, I need this, like I said, the potentiometer if I can just get more a fine tuning. I, I'm looking for just a little bit under this on the vibration state. But I think we're fairly close right here. So why is this so important? Well, because the bottom motor is pretty much set. It, it's done. I, I have the perfect tune in it that I like. I'm just adjusting the top. And you saw earlier that the fields themselves are actually changing based on the tuning in it. What does that mean? I have a resonance point in my bottom, uh, my bottom disc. I have a resonance point in my top disc. And when they come together, I'm getting a resonance point in my center disc. And it's all three working together. What is it doing? You saw the field come out and it getting brighter on the light. I'm amplifying the field by putting it in a resonance mode. So did I find the right point in this? Yeah, I did. Now we're going to move on to the mic test on this. This is the same testing video. I just cut out a little bit because it was boring. But I wanted to show you this. And just understand this. You saw the fields earlier. You saw that I got the motors in tune. I told you it's in residence. Now I want you to listen to the background a little bit. What you're going to find is it starts messing with my computer. I said I had an over unity event. <laughs> And you're going to see it coming up here where it starts to show a little bit. Not as much as it did that one time, but this shows you just a little bit of it. So why am I testing the mic on all this stuff? I can show you the mic video probably a little later. But what I'm doing is looking for any spots in here where the Tesla coil spikes. Or anything spikes anywhere as far as the sound goes. I found a dead spot in the top four inches of my Tesla coil that my mic won't pick up. So just understand that and going on here. So right there, you just heard the bing sound. That was my camera dying. It just shut off. So right now, it's pushing that field out. <coughs> so right here, I'm getting a little trouble with some of my electronics, guys. There you go. You heard that binging? I had to go over to my computer now because it's starting to freak out on me. So, yeah, it's pretty bad, guys. The field's pushing out right now. I know I'm getting the field out of it. And this is the conventional way of putting it. This is not me putting the uh, static electricity on the outside. This is the static electricity on the inside disk this time. So you can see it's pushing the field. You see, I didn't touch those motors at all. You see the extra vibration it's getting now? We're in that resonance state. At this point, I'm shutting my computers down. So, it's a really cool thing, guys. We're right on the edge of tuning it correctly. But you noticed how it went from vibration pretty hard and it's starting to smooth out? 
that point right there is the exact point that I needed to get to. Can you hear all the interference? Now you can barely hear it there, but it's still there. Still, still messing with my computer. All right. So let's move on to the next portion of this test. You can kind of see some things going on. And I'm trying to fix it in the background. But it's not necessarily working. So this is the sound test right here. And it's what you saw in the other video, but from a different camera. As I told you, my camera shut off the first time, so this is the second time around that I'm doing this. So you can hear it now. We're just looking for anomalies in this. Now I want you to notice the bottom is very calm. The upper plate is the one that's going through a lot of turbulence. So keep that in mind. Now let's go to the Tesla coil. Right there. It's not wanting to pick that up. And now we get the sound again. There it goes. Top four inches. Doesn't want to hear it. Let's go over the end. And we're getting the sound. So we definitely have something going on that's killing our mic in the top four inches of this Tesla coil. There's no question about it. I don't like it in the center at all either. And you can see the field is localized. That's why I'm doing this test here. I'm trying to figure it out. Now I need to get a different mic and a lot of people suggested different ones to find this uh, out and see what frequency is actually making. And I have uh, bought another mic. So it's on its way. We'll see how it does later on. So we're not picking up a whole lot outside this just normal static, normal stuff that's going on here. Let's go back to that. Hold on. Let's go back to that right now. I went in and out of a vibrational state. I want to see that it's doing. But check out that state again. I don't know if it's picking it up all that well as it did in person. So what we're getting here, guys, is the moment where it goes from vibrating the entire frame to the motor smoothing it out. And the frame, it doesn't stop vibrating, but the motor itself, the shakiness and everything, goes away for a second. And then it comes back. I know it's kind of hard to see, but it is going on there. Again, we got Alexi's gravity flyer on the left. We got mine on the right. We're just looking at the bottom disc here. We're just looking for motor speed and see if we got it correct. I'd say we're almost dead on right there. Let's take a look. There it is. Our, mo our motor is actually running at 11.5 volts on a 12 volt motor. So let's look at this again. This is a different uh, video on the right, but you can see the motor speed again. We are just about equivalent to Alexi's gravity flyer right there. I have it tuned down just a little bit than I did before on this one here. So this one's at 11.1 uh, volt. I believe it was at 11.5 before. We are really, really close to that speed, so I think it's just about perfect.
So let's go back to this again. This is our field strength test. You saw that we had the bottom motor correct. You've also seen that the top motor, we know how to set it now. We heard the sound. We know that we're getting our field pushed out. So again, the tuning of this is very important. When we set that up for this, you see it's just slightly off now, right? This means that the more power that's coming out of it comes out when you tune it correctly. So everything has to be tuned in sync with each other. It's not just one thing. There's multiple things going on here and you have to tune everything back to that center plate. So, we'll get this thing. There it goes. You see the field just pop on. Now everything, you even see the motor starting to make the shaking a little less. You see it's all bright. This is how you know you got it tuned right. Everything is now tuned back to that center plate. All right, let's move on to the next test, but you can see exactly what I'm trying to do here now. Let's continue to talk about the field, and let's talk about our Tesla coil. Watch this real quick. You're going to miss it if you don't understand it. Right here. Not on, not on, not on. Upper four inches, on perfectly. It's putting out more right there. We're at very low on our Tesla coil. So, we know that that spot's amplified. Now, right now, I'm turning up the Tesla coil, and I'm bringing voltage to this. And what you're going to see is it's going to start to spark over. You're going to get the interaction from the Tesla coil in the center plate here to interact with the upper plate. See, there it goes. You're starting to see little sparks in there. Now, the Tesla coil is only hooked to the center plate. So we're getting an interaction here. Again, the top four inches of that Tesla coil where we found the anomaly with the sound is where it, it has the most value to it. Now we look at this. Now we see that we have an interaction between our center plate and our upper plate. Now it also goes into our lower plate the same way. So, understand in testing this now, now see it's lit up pretty good. Now my field strength is real good. It's kind of the key, guys. What I'm trying to show you here is the interaction between every little part of electricity on this. The Tesla coil affects the high voltage. The high voltage also affects the Tesla coil. Now my motor speeds are pretty much close to where they were last time. So we're almost right in. We're just not in that perfect state of resonance where it's shaking a little bit. It's just a little bit off. But we're right, right there. And we got a great field going on this. So... Does it have to be completely shaking? No, but I do I know that's right before liftoff? Yes, I do. Do I know that right after when it shakes and smooths out, does it lift? Yes, it does. And it has to do with that piezoelectric disc in there and how it's working and how it collapses that top field. So let's look into that a little bit. Let's go ahead and show real quick before I do. You see it's sparking off on the bottom. Now, my discs are set... Uh, seven eighths on the top between the center plate and the upper and we're looking at an inch and a half on the bottom here between the center plate and the lower disc so you can see how far it's pushing that interaction so the one i didn't talk about here is the eddy current interaction and because i ran very uh bad magnets on the bottom or rare earth magnets instead of neodymium you're not seeing that affect the center disc too much. So we're getting a better feel all together in this. So let's go ahead and let's look at the actual field collapse and see if we can get that one figured out as well. So in this test right here, we're looking at the electrostatic field in the upper and lower plate. So again, just to set this up for you, the center plate is connected to my Tesla coil. The high voltage is connected to my upper and lower spinning disc. As you can see, I have a negative voltage on the bottom. And then right here, in between, I have a negative voltage. Now again, the top disc is positive. But in between the top disc and the center disc, there's a negative voltage going on there. That has to do with the eddy current. 
it is forcing that negative into the center plate, into the bottom, and it's coming up right in between the discs. So as you can see, our top disc is definitely positive. Now I do have the ultrasound connected in this, and we're trying to collapse that top. Now, my tuning is exactly the same on the motors, but we're not in that resonant state. So, I'll have to test again for this and putting it right in that perfect spot. I had done this test before I did the ones earlier, so I didn't have it perfect. You can see it's still shaking around a little bit, but not to the point where we're at perfect resonance. So we'll have to test the field again and put this static meter on again. I did talk to Charlie C and he said that I can add more voltage before, excuse me, beyond the five volts that I put into it. And I had one and a half amps coming into it as well. So the ultrasound can probably take a little more. So I'm going to add a little bit more to it because I'm not getting that top field to collapse. So, why is this important? In order to get this thing to lift, this top plate has to be at zero on the positive charge. What, what is it doing? Well, we're looking at a longitudinal or a straight down, however you want to say it, of the uh, piezoelectric disc knocking out that top disc field. So, what happens? It won't allow the spark or anything to come over from the high voltage coil on the positive side to actually discharge onto the disc anymore once the piezoelectric is taken over. And that's what it does. It dissolves that top field and that top plate and only puts the field at the bottom. So that's the important lift factor here. So it gets me to thinking about our ultrasound. Do we have it connected right? We, we push the button to turn it off. I'm not so sure that we shouldn't push the button to turn it on. And I know that's backwards, and I know that's not the way Alexi set it up, and I'm perfectly understanding of that. But I'm going to try it the opposite way. Because I think I'm looking for a resonance point that it hits. And if it hits there, I'm amplifying that resonance point to go up. I'm not breaking into the other side of it where it shoves the spike through it. So it might just be in that little bit that we could figure this out just a little bit more. It's just one of the ideas that I have that I'm going to try. But I'm looking right here for that top disc to collapse the field. And that's really what this test is. It's getting that uh, static field to just collapse on the top. So you can see right here, the positive's still in there. And I'll hold it at a better angle later, but I'm trying to see if there's anything in between the disc. Now I'm on that upper disc right there and you can see it so what this test is guys is we got to figure out exactly where the fields are and I know a lot of you out there probably don't have this meter and hopefully if, if you get really into this you'll you'll get one but you got to know where every field is and you got to know with the light like we did earlier to see exactly what it is so let's go back real quick to what I was talking about, about the ultrasound and pushing the button. If when the ultrasound's on, I'm looking to collapse the field. And I know that there's a balance between the top and the bottom field. There's always positive, always negative on the bottom. If I push the button and collapse the top field with the piezo disc, what happened? All of the charge is now on the negative half. That would seem that that's the lift point. Not when you have it on all the time and you cannot constantly collapse the top field. It seems to me, in my opinion, you push the button, it collapses the top field, allows more energy to hit the bottom field, and then this thing lifts. I think that's a myth on our part when we evaluate all the things that are going on. I know the circuitry doesn't say it that way. I get that. I think it is that way though. And we're going to have to test that. It makes too much sense not to look at it. So I needed to address this before I went any further. The magnets I went to was a rare earth magnet instead of the neodymium magnets. There was a reason for that. 
You heard me say earlier that it's affecting the eddy current in the plates. Again, this is all aluminum. So we're doing eddy currents here. Now, I also have trouble collapsing the top field. What do I think is the problem? It's the eddy current. The eddy current is not allowing me to collapse that top field or move that top field anywhere. So, why do I go with the lesser magnet? This has to do with also the plate spacing. I probably have my plate spacing a little too high, or excuse me, it was called a little too low maybe on the bottom. Either way, the distance between the center plate and the bottom plate is an inch and a half. It probably needs to go to two inches. I don't want the eddy current in my top plate. I want that to go away. I want the eddy current in the bottom portion under the center plate, not in the upper part of my problem at all or upper part of my gravity flyer at all. It's just creating a problem. And that's part of the tuning here. In order to collapse that top field properly, either you have to add more of the piezo disc, more electricity to it, or I have to reduce the eddy current. And I think it's a combination of probably both. So do the magnets matter? Yeah, they matter a lot. And it, it has to do with that understanding of how the fields work. So I'll continue with the video now, but I had to make sure I tell you that the reason I changed the magnets to a rare earth magnet instead of a neodymium magnet is getting too much eddy current in my top plate. Now we talked about the piezo and the static charge. This is a paper lifter experiment. This is going to tell us a lot about what we're doing here. The top plate positively charged, bottom plate negatively charged. The top plate is bigger than the smaller plate and it only works in one direction. Now what is it doing? It's applying force up through that center paper UFO looking thing. It's pushing the force up. So what do I think is going on in our gravity flyer? If we take away all the so-called knowns that we have right now, and just think about it in this way, we're using the same static charge. We're using two flybacks in series connected, at least I am, to go to heavy static charge, or we're thinning out the voltage you get the static charge. So instead of collapsing the top disc out of the positive charge completely, what happens if I push that positive charge from the top plate that's spinning into the center disc, even for a second? What does that do? It now gives me this experiment. The top plate is positively charged. So that would be the center of our gravity flyer, the center plate. The bottom plate is negatively charged. Now I'm going to apply force in the upwards direction. That's exactly what we're looking for in our gravity flyer. That's why this test is so important to the gravity flyer to understand it. Now, this is going to show you the force in the opposite direction. The big plate is on the bottom. The small plate is on the top. Again, if we're looking for force, guys, and we're looking for force in a certain direction, watch. It sucks immediately back down. All the potential is hitting right there in that force. This tells us everything we need to know about static charge and why it's in this, this upper and lower disc and not necessarily in the center one right away. When it's separated, we get balance. When the top plate is charged and the bottom plate is charged and the center plate is a neutral, we get a balance. So it stays where it's supposed to stay. When we create an imbalance and we take that center plate and we charge it one way to the positive and we charge the bottom to a negative, we get an imbalance. So that means it has a lifting factor. It's pushing up. So that's why I think sometimes we look at the piezo disc and we just want to say, let's not just collapse the field on the top. Let's force that field down to the center plate. Now, with electrostatic charge, we can make a lift. That's why some of these experiments that look odd come into our gravity flyer. You're going to have to know this. This is kind of why I put the static charge on the outside. I wanted to see the field strength of it. If 
but I also am very, very aware of how static electricity works as far as lift goes. So, again, if we don't dissolve the upper discharge, and all we do is force it into the center plate, at one moment it'll lift, and then when it can no longer hold that static charge of the positive in the center plate, it must now go back to a balanced state where you have positive charge on a top disc and negative charge on the bottom disc, and now it'll hold steady in the air. I think this is where we're going to get our lifting factor. It's a lot of knowledge. It's a lot to interpret. But I think this is where we're going with it. It has to be done in these precise ways. Everybody always wants to know why it's so hard to tune this thing and get it to go. Well, if you don't know a lot of these experiments, it becomes a very difficult task to put this thing together. Again, I think this experiment should be done by every person that does the gravity flyer. And I think you'll really start to understand my perspective and where I come into it at. Now that we have an understanding of what our static charge is doing, and that we, we now have a correct way to look at it, if we can create that in balance, it'll actually make it lift. So what's the problem with everything? Well, let's look at the Tesla coil again in this experiment. Again, this one is a Tesla coil connected to the center plate. So it goes around the entire gravity flyer. And in the center is our static electricity. That's the proper way it should be. Now, how do I know that? When I change the field and I swap the field, I put a static bolt on the outside and I put the Tesla coil on the inside. What did it do? It forced out the static field to everything in my garage. It's a video I did on the over-unity event. So, what am I saying here? That the field itself from the Tesla coil is stronger than you think it is. So, it'll force the field out, but will it also hold the field in? And that's one of the important factors here. The Tesla coil is the field that holds in the static charge. Now, you say, well, but how do I get my center plate to be positive so I can get the lift from the static? Now, isn't that the key? The only way to do this is you have to start to see the electricity going into everything that you're putting in. I keep getting a lot of people saying your Tesla coil is AC. That is a complete lie in this case. There is no AC voltage or sine wave in my Tesla coil at all. Sounds strange, doesn't it? It, it? it sounds wrong because everybody names it as AC. But let's look at how it's built. All I'm doing is turning a transistor on and off. And it's a DC voltage that goes into it. That's it, guys. That There's no AC in this. It's a square wave. It is a pulsed voltage that's going into it. That's it. That's why the field's are interacting. How do we create our high voltage? It is a DC that's created through a flyback. Again, DC voltage. Why are the two fields interacting the way they do? Because if it was AC and DC, the fields wouldn't interact at all. But since they're both the DC voltage going in, the fields are alike. Now, they interact. Again, very, very important. The Tesla coil is a pulse DC, not AC. There is no sine wave in it. It is a pulse DC because of the way it's built. So, now our fields interact. Now you can start to see why the actual static charge of the positive can now go into the center plate. Because it's almost the same field, guys. It's exactly what we're looking for here. In order for that to, to go over and transfer to that center plate and make it positive at any point, the understanding has to be that they're like fields. And that's the key to this. Now, you just heard me describe this thing as static volts on the inside and a field holding it in. 
and we're looking at tuning and we looked at the motor speed and everything and how that amplifies everything. Understand this. If we break it down to everything we need, you cannot break gravity without resonance. It won't work. We saw that our motors, along with our fields, can create resonance in the center plate. And it amplifies it based on the electricity coming in from both the testicle and the high voltage. You wonder why this thing's so hard to tune. If I didn't tell you all that stuff and you just put high voltage into it, it would never work. What I'm doing is I'm breaking down each part of the field. Why do I think I'm so close to lift on this when I can clearly see it right now, right in front of you, not doing anything? It's because I'm understanding every little aspect of this in a different way than maybe you are. I can see the interactions. I know what breaks gravity. I keep bringing up the experiment of horses on a bridge. Why does that make the bridge go crazy? It's because it's creating resonance. It's one of the most powerful things we're going to find. And scientists will tell you everywhere. And most experiments that they do when it comes to these voltages, you need to create a resonance. It needs to become a field by itself. That's what's going to break our gravity. Then our static electricity is going to make our lift. Our Tesla coil is going to hold in the field. This is really the understanding of this. I know we all laughed at Alexi used some junkyard parts. I think it's absolutely genius that he could do that. That, that he knew all of this in, in, in creating this thing. So... Hopefully I've described to you guys today exactly what I'm looking for and exactly what's going on and exactly the interactions here. Because if you want to build this, you should really watch this video again because it's going to tell you a lot and it'll get you to tuning a lot faster than you ever were before. So that's it for today, guys. If you like what you saw here today, please like, share, subscribe, do all those fun things, and have yourself a great day. Thank you.